So I used to be an opera singer. I lived away from Gibraltar for about 12 years in total. I sang in fully staged operatic productions, concerts, recitals, in different parts of the world. But then we decided we wanted to move back to Gibraltar and raise our family here. I became a professional accountant. I did my ACCA exams in a very short space of time, sitting three exams at a time. And in the meantime, there was always swimming. So as a boy and teenager, I was very competitive in the pool. And then when I came back to Gibraltar, I joined the Bluefin Open Water Swimming Club and found my love for open water swimming. So in 2015, I decided I wanted to test myself as an open water swimmer. I did a couple of round the rocks. Having done well in those, I decided I wanted to swim the Strait of Gibraltar the following year. After that, I put my name down for the English Channel. And in preparation for the English Channel, I swam a double round the rock, which is from Western Beach to Eastern Beach, and then back again to Western Beach. A distance of 23 kilometers and a swim that hadn't been done before. Now, when I prepare for one of these big swims, what I try to acquire is resilience. I put myself in difficult situations on a regular basis. I expose myself to harsh conditions regularly so that when these present themselves in the big swims, I am well prepared. Now, what I learned from swimming the English Channel was the importance of leaning on your support team. You lean on your support team so that you can focus fully on what you're there to do. Now, my support team is usually my wife, my parents, other family members and friends. So what they need to do is know exactly when I need to stop, what I need to feed and drink, how those drinks are prepared, the temperature of those drinks, so that I can think solely on swimming. Now, the pilot of the vessel is also a very important part of the support team. They dictate the course of the swim, taking into account the swimmer's speed, the currents and the tide on that particular day because the aim is to arrive at your destination in the shortest amount of time possible, so that you spend the least amount of time in that cold water, which is the real challenge. Now, all of this is made possible by adopting good time management. So I like to think of how quickly do I move from being at work, working, to being in a training session, or being with my family, spending quality time. How quickly do I transition from one state to another without losing any time in between? As an example of time management and how I put it into practice, when I did my ACCA exams, I used to go into the office at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and on a Saturday and study for four hours solid. As a result, I was then able to enjoy quality time with my family in the afternoon and evening. And I was effective in my studies because I had set aside that fully concentrated, fully focused period of study. And I had done it at work, in the office, rather than at home. So in 2017, I swam a double straight of Gibraltar. This was the toughest swim that I've ever done in terms of physical energy requirements. So when I arrived in Morocco, the pilots of the vessel said, look, it's complicated. We left an hour late due to fog. You've encountered strong currents against you. And as a result, we've arrived here very late in the day. So when you swim back up to Spain, you're going to find that the conditions become very rough and the current is going to be much stronger than expected, pulling you into the Mediterranean. So you're likely not going to hit land. And then in addition, he said, if you quit now, we'll charge you for a single straight. But if you carry on swimming, we're going to have to charge you for a double, even if you're unsuccessful. So there I am, floating in Morocco, trying to make a decision, should I carry on swimming, or should I call it a day? And at that point in time, my dad asked the pilot of the vessel, is there any chance whatsoever that he could make it? And the pilot of the vessel said, there is a very slight, remote possibility that he could make it. And that was enough for me. I started swimming again. 
because I had already been there for the single straight, and I was more afraid of never having the opportunity to attempt a double straight again than I was of failing the swim on that attempt. So indeed, it got very rough on the way up, and it was a very, very tough swim. But I was rewarded with a successful swim in the end. So when do you think I feel the most joy? During a training session, or when I complete one of these big swims? By a show of hands, when do I feel the most joy? During a training session, or when I complete one of these big swims? Okay, so it was a trick question. So when I complete one of these big swims, what I feel is pride and satisfaction. But I am genuinely concerned about my health. I want to get on that vessel as quickly as possible, wrap up, have something warm to drink. Because you never know how your body is going to react after you've been swimming for nine or ten hours and you stop. Whereas, on the other hand, when I'm training, with every single stroke that I swim, I feel like I'm getting closer to achieving my ultimate objective. With every single training session, I feel like my body is growing in the right direction. And by having those targets and those objectives, my life is more meaningful. And all of this combined adds to my overall level of happiness and joy. So what I learned from the world of opera was discipline, amongst many other things. So as an opera singer, you have to take care of your voice, eat the right food, sleep enough. You have to learn and perform the music accurately and strictly according to the composer's wishes. Not in the least, because you have, you have a conductor and an orchestra trying to accompany you. So I've been able to put into practice a lot of what I've learned in terms of discipline from the world of opera in everything else that I've done subsequently. So also in 2017, I traveled to the States and I swam the Catalina Channel. The Catalina Channel is roughly the size of the English Channel. So be between 34, 36 kilometers. The only difference with this swim is that it was a night swim. And the reason you swim it at night is because during the day, the wind picks up, it becomes very rough and unswimmable. So there I am, pitch black, I couldn't see the lights of Los Angeles, which was so far away that I, that I couldn't see them. And I start swimming into the night when the body's asking for bedtime. There was a massive swell for the first four hours, making me very seasick. I swam into seaweed, planks of wood, plastic, got stung by jellyfish, got nibbled at my feet by some unknown sea creatures, <laughs> swam into a swarm of pyrosome jelly-like tubes that glowed in the night. I didn't know what they were at, at the time. So I was genuinely very, very scared for the first few hours of this swim. And the reason I believe I was able to continue swimming and complete the swim was because I was able to fully focus on my swimming, fully focus on what I was there to do. I was able to shut out the noise and ignore the distractions. So I was focusing on my swimming technique, adapting that technique to the changing conditions, and monitoring my energy levels, so the things within my control. And I think it's a useful skill to have. For example, at work, if you have a project to hand in by a certain deadline, the ability to be able to focus fully on that and ignore the distractions and shut out the noise makes you much more effective. So last year, summer 2018, I swam 46 kilometers around the island of Manhattan. This is also a very tough swim, because the final two or three hours of the swim, you're swimming down the Hudson, and you've got this swell coming in from the Atlantic Ocean head on. Now, when swims get tough, what comes to mind is a famous saying by Captain Matthew Webb, the first person to cross the English Channel. And he said, nothing great is easy. Nothing great is easy. 
And once you say that to yourself often enough, you start to realize that in order to achieve these challenges, you're going to have to suffer. And once you accept that you're going to have to suffer, then you're prepared to put in the work. So all of these swims that I've done have been equally tough in different ways. There's always unforeseeable circumstances, difficulties which arise. So it's useful not to have the delusion that these swims are going to be easy. And then the swims meet your expectations and you're better prepared for them as a result. Nothing great is easy. But it's not all about pain. So in the beginning, when you start training, after you've taken a break, those tra training sessions are very hard. Your body's not used to that intensity. But the more you train, you pick up, you grow exponentially, and you're able to pile on the intensity, the duration of the swims, the distances, with minimal extra effort. You grow exponentially, you gain momentum, break the inertia. But it's the same with your mind. So the more new things you learn, the easier it is to learn new things. You step outside of the box, you move from your comfort zone, and the more often you do that, the easier it becomes to absorb new information and to grow as a professional, as an individual. Now, the open water swimming community is very sharing of skills and knowledge experiences, the risks associated with these swims. So you write to someone on the other side of the world and they'll reply as soon as they can, giving you all the information that they're able to. And I think it's, a, it's an admirable culture to follow in everything that we do. Everyone benefits from it. So for example, at work, if you teach someone to do part of your, your job, you're able to focus on something that needs to get done, something that you're good at, or able to grow in a different area and become more valuable as a professional, again, as an individual, more valuable to your organization, for example. For me, I've been very fortunate to always have a support team there. I've been fortunate to have colleagues that have shared their experiences and their knowledge with me, and as a result of that, I've been able to achieve all these things. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, uh, Julian, for that. Thanks for the invite. Um, if you're wondering about the beard, by the way, <laughs> um, I, I had I'd grown a beard some months ago. Um, one of my daughters said to me when I shaved it off, well, why did you shave it off? Um, and I said, oh, did you like it? Do you, do you want me to grow it again? A and she said, yes, um, because otherwise there's just too much face. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am trying not to offend people with my face. Um, I haven't timed this, by the way, so this could go badly wrong. Um, but uh, thankfully, we've got a timer. So I'll just, I'll just uh, jump straight into it. Uh, we are living in an age uh, where if you can't say something in 140 characters in a tweet, it's not worth saying. It's almost like the end of thoughtfulness, which, you know, I decry, because sometimes things need to be well thought through. They need to take a bit more time. They need to be sa said over a few pages, and not just in one soundbite. And less is sometimes poorer, and we need to be more reflective. And less also brings harshness and rigidity of its own, with its own price of insensitivity. And we see it on social media. You know, there was a, a very well-known film uh, a couple of years ago called The Social Network. Sometimes I go on Facebook in Gibraltar and I think it should be called The Anti-Social Network. Technology, undoubtedly, has changed our lives and how we interact and do business. And, but how different it w all was from uh, the 1970s and 80s uh, and how I grew up. It's important to, I suppose, reflect and, and not forget you know, that quote from Thomas Hardy that time changes everything except some, something within us 
which is always surprised by change. I was brought up in a very different Gibraltar, or at least a Gibraltar that was different in some respects. What I intend to do today, this morning, in the brief time that I've got, is to cover the context of the changing Gibraltar and then dive into three examples. Firstly, of how society changed. Secondly, of how uh, it's, there has been something that was slow to change but has been changing. And thirdly, I'll give an example of something that, in my view, has not changed at all. I'm then going to argue that positivity can bring change or should be applied to that changing context. But first, let me take a snapshot back into history and that nostalgia of the Gibraltar of the 1970s and 80s, where I grew up. It wasn't all good, but it wasn't all bad. And, you know, those of us who were around at the time, and, uh, you know, there's a mixed audience today, but you'll remember the 70s and 80s in Gibraltar, the closed frontier the scarcity of land, the, the housing crisis, how the MOD had most of the land in Gibraltar. You know, I remember as a teenager, uh, the Commonwealth Park was, as you know, the, it was a hockey pitch, the NOP. There was a, it was guarded by, uh, it was locked up by the MOD. We used to jump the wall uh, as teenagers go and play football. From time to time, the the, the Navy on duty would realize that these uh, pesky teenagers are again playing football, so he'd come with his Alsatian and, and uh, throw it, at, you know, put the dog onto us, and then we'd jump the wall and, and, and escape again. And uh, that was the kind of Gibraltar I, I grew up in. Europa Point, you know, Rosier Swimming Club that we couldn't go to, Nuffield Pool, again, we couldn't go to. Um, it was a very different Gibraltar. There was water at Montague Pavilion instead of housing. Uh, there was water at Shepherd's Marina instead of Ocean Village. And there was, as you all know, instead of Safeways or Morrisons, um, there was a road uh, beyond Chilton Court with a barrier that, again, we couldn't get through. And there were Moroccan workers at Casements, as you know. Um, Above all, there, was, there were no mobile phones, internet, calculators, and indeed, I remember using the abacus <laughs> at, uh, at, uh, at school. There was, in, in some respects, almost uh, voluntary, but also imposed segregation. The MOD and their families, Moroccan workers, imposed segregation, and different uh, examples of civilians and members of religious communities. And of course, that's the product of history. And we talk about tolerance. I also, always think that tolerance is a bad word. Actually, we should celebrate cultural diversity in Gibraltar. But we also need to recognize that this is an area where there hasn't been sufficient change as, as quickly as there should be. Because in some respects, I was brought up in a place where, yes, it was tolerant, but uh, there was voluntary segregation in different districts. And the Moroccan workers was, also, was always a very good example. There were four factors, in my view, that made things change. The physical barriers fell in 1982 and 1985. The frontier opened for pedestrians and then for cars. Education, how youngsters went to the UK in larger numbers. There was an economic shift that made Gibraltar much more cosmopolitan, from the MOD to the private sector. And there was a mix of nationalities that came in in the private sector. And you see that, for example, in the gaming industry. All that and new technologies brought new pressures, though, challenges and opportunities. But it did, of course, uh, bring that change. So I'm going to jump into those examples that I said. The first example, how society has changed very radically. In the area of social media and young people, um, I've got daughters. Have you ever tried to get teenage daughters to call each other on a landline? Well, they don't do that anymore. You know, I've, sometimes I'll say to one of my daughters, well, you know, are, are we going to do something? Well, I'm not sure. I'm waiting for one of my friends to say whether they are going to uh, answer. And I said, well, have, have, you, uh, have you spoken to them? Oh, yes, I've sent them a message, but it's, it's delivered but not read. Um, well, why don't you give them a call? Oh, no, Dad, we don't do that. Um, so you, you get that. The gadgetry and evolution is almost like the new artificial limb. They can't do without it, but the resulting pressures on young people, the anxiety, sometimes the depression, sometimes the bullying that goes on social media. I believe that there needs to be global regulation and better enforcement of social media and content. It must come because these are not things that we were brought up with. 
and we as a society need to grapple and deal with it. In Little Gibraltar, there's not much we can do because we don't control these, these big social media platforms. But as a, as a world society, there must be more to be done to control social media content. And last week, there was a very um, touching story of, of, a, of a teenage suicide and, and a father going on, on, uh, on the media to explain how Instagram posts had then been found on her, on her feed and how that could have uh, also led her to, to take a particular course that was so tragic in that family. So we need to do much more in the area of social media for young people to give them support and indeed to regulate content. I'll give you an example of something that has been slow to change in my opinion. The issue, issues of discrimination and intolerance. The Viewpoint program on housing the other day was so powerful uh, and showing that we've really not got to grips with that area in many ways. Sexism, I think Gibraltar is still a chauvinistic <laughs> society in some respects and I think we need to deal with that and, and give real equality uh, and, and jump into the 21st century in a serious way. Our attitudes to mental health have been improving but there's still stigma and we need to deal with all, all that. And I believe positivity and education can break down those barriers. Let's not forget that, as Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. He also added that no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can learn to love. And that we should apply most particularly to our long-term residents in the Moroccan community or our British Gibraltarians of Moroccan origin. There's something that did not change at all though, and that is, in my opinion, our interface with Spain. Whether it was Franco Spain or democratic Spain, we still see the same interface with Spain, the antagonism and acrimony with Spain. And that I regret because there is a need for positivity, to achieve what we call convivencia, that cohabitation where we finally recognize and respect that we are cohabiting in this piece of Latin Mediterranean Southern Europe without claiming each uh, uh, land, respecting our human rights and allowing and recognizing that this small territory does not represent a threat to modern Spain and that we enjoy going to modern Spain, but that does not make us want to be Spanish. Positivity is a powerful weapon, but there is always a tension with negativity. There's always a choice between negativity and positivity, and sometimes we fall into the trap of that negative discourse. We certainly do in the political world, and I'm the first to admit it, as a reaction sometimes. Try it. We need to try as much as possible to present a contest of ideas and hope because we need to have that bravery and audacity of thinking that things can actually change. Julian mentioned that I started in politics a long time ago, and indeed, and I took a break, um, and I came back to politics because in many ways, I remain an idealist, and I believe in our future. You know, I, I guess I could have stayed in the comfort of my living room. It was certainly more sheltered. There was no name calling. Well, actually, only sometimes. <laughs> but changing things is not easy. But for me, getting involved was the only way to try to effect change. After all, it was Gandhi who said, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Audacity. Audacity is a, world, is a word I like. The audacity of thinking that something can change. The sheer goal of believing, the view that things don't need to stay the same, that the norm is not permanent, that what has been done for decades wrongly is not our way of life, but is a shackle to be abandoned. The audacity of thinking that we can do better, the audacity of believing and hoping for a better day. I have not stopped believing in the idea that things can change and that we have a bright future. 
there is far too much negativity and far too little positivity, far too much despair and too little hope, far too much introspection and far too little vision, far too much caution and far too little radicalizing change. I believe in the politics of hope, of giving our people hope that things will change, that we are up to the challenge, that we can create opportunities for everyone, from the small business owner in Main Street to the MOD worker, from the young person who left school at 16 to the returning university student. The standpoint of positivity, in my opinion, is crucial, that we have a clear and positive vision for the future, that we represent new and exciting ideas, that our vision is sustainable, that we are not just telling people what they want to hear, but what is in the long-term interests of our community. It is positivity and not negativity that will win the hearts and minds. And that is the task we have. I read a book last year called The Path. It's a revealing book, it's, I recommend it. Um, it's a book that talks about the ripples of change, how little things can change things. When you smile to people, they'll, it ripples across society. Where little gestures ripple across society from small human interactions to big gestures. Positivity needs to be the focus, whether it is a personal target or societal change as a society. Be the change that you seek. Set positive parameters and take that idealism and, and objectives forward in sport, culture and in any field. Break down barriers, discrimination to actually make those changes. Because in this changing society, we all need to embrace the reality of the ever-changing environment and dynamic and try to bring about the benefits in that change through a positive approach, however tempting negativity sometimes is. Thank you very much. you. I'll be talking about the archives later on, but I've got a few things to say before that. Uh, when, when one has lived on this planet for over 80 years, there are bound to be many uh, memories in a think tank, and I would like to share some of those with you today. I was an evacuee, first to French Morocco, and then to war-torn London. So I suppose you could say that there, but for the grace of God, go I. Now, since I was only two at the time, uh, my memories of the war years are very sketchy. However, I do have very vivid memories of life in post-war Gibraltar in the 1950s. And looking around the audience, I'm sure that some of the things I have to say will t trigger some memories in their minds as well. Now, the more fortunate evacuees uh, were housed in the newly uh, constructed Alameda housing estate, still known to this day as Humphreys, uh, after the name of the contractor. But others, including my family, were not so lucky and continued to live in pre-war accommodation in the upper town. I sometimes wonder how present-day Gibraltarians would react to the living conditions there. For a start, we had no running water, no turning on of the ta taps, uh, and certainly no bathroom, obviously. So every day, we remember rightly, around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, a lady who was one of the neighbors appointed by the city council would blow her whistle, which was the signal for the neighbors to pick up their buckets and trudge to the communal fountains at the end of the patio. Again, if my memory serves me right, the cost was one old penny for every two buckets. The water was then deposited in a large earthenware receptacle known as a tinaja, uh, in a specially designated area known as el lavadero. From there, families would draw their daily needs, uh, and for the weekly wash, one used a metal bath, also stored in the lavadero, and the water was heated by means of the coal furnace in the kitchen, which incidentally also served as the living room. Toilets were communal. In our case, one toilet served four families. And if you had to go after dark, you needed to take a candle with you because there was no light inside the toilet. Needless to say, we had no telephone, no television set, and certainly no iPads. 
And yet, as children, we lived happy and contented lives, making our own entertainment. So I suppose it is, as the saying goes, what the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't yearn for. Today, it is wonderful to see so many young Gibraltarian boys and girls going to university. In the mid-90s, that privilege was restricted to two individuals per year. There was the government scholarship and the Victoria Macintosh scholarship. There were other lesser bursaries for teacher training. I've sometimes reflected how many of deserving John Gibraltarians of my generation missed out because of this. Now, at the end of my schooling years, I had an important decision to make. Will I apply for the two big ones or settle for one of the teacher bursaries? I knew that the competition for the former would be fierce, so I went along to the Department of Education to ask for advice, and the advice given on reflection was pretty obvious. Uh, has stayed with me all my life. Uh, if you don't apply, you won't get it. And so I applied. And a very vivid memory concerns the day when I was coming down from Sacred Heart Terrace, where the old grammar school used to be, uh, and down the steps by the old police barracks, to find my mother picking the daily supply of water, but also clutching a letter. Uh, it was addressed to me, but of course she'd already opened it. Uh, it, it informed me that I had been awarded the Victoria Macintosh Scholarship for that year. Now, Mum had mixed feelings about this, happy for my success, but already worrying about our little boy going so far away. And so, in 1957, I went off to Edinburgh University to read history, and at the end of my studies, for reasons too complicated to go into in the time I've got available, I did not return to Gibraltar, but took up a teaching post in the Midlands of England. The school was run by the Christian Brothers, so in a sense I was renewing an association going back to my school days. By then I had married and we settled down in England. However, I did not completely cut off myself from my home homeland. Uh, we were here every summer during the long, lovely long summer holidays that teachers used to have. Now, I want to fast forward now to the 1980s, uh, when my life changed quite dramatically. When my wife died in, in 1979, I had very important decisions to make. Although by then I was in line for the deputy headship in England, the urge to return to my rock grew apace. Friends thought that I was suffering from shock, not thinking straight, but in the end I returned to Gibraltar and took up a teaching post in Bayside. The early 80s were to prove life-changing years for me. I remarried in 1981, my daughter was born in 1982, and in 1984, the post of government archivist became available. Friends advised me, don't take it. It's a dead-end job, there is no prospects for promotion. But I took the plunge, I applied, and as you know, I was successful. I had had previous experience of the archives in the course of my research into the evacuation, more of that later if time allows, so I knew I was taking on an enormous task. The archives at the time were, consisted of two rooms behind the convent, one of which was unusable because the floor, the floor had collapsed and the other was dark and gloomy. When I was introduced to the main part of the collection, I began to wonder what I had taken on. I opened the door to two large stores in Naval Hospital Hill and was confronted with literally mountains of papers, which I was informed had been shoved off the back of lorries by Moroccan workers. During the next 20 years, the archives were transformed to what I think they look like today. The original rooms were refurbished. I gradually managed to acquire two further uh, two new rooms, and the joke at the time amongst the GSP uh, men at the gate there was that if I continued to expand, the governor would have to move to the mount. But that was, that was never, never on. Now, the documents were also gradually sorted out, boxed and labelled. And if you happen to visit the archives today, you will see the result there of 20 years of hard labour. There were also side effects to all this. 
I was called upon to do radio and television programs, to give lectures, to write articles in the local press. Now, all along, I had been fascinated by the evacuation of the civilian population of Gibraltar during the Second World War. I found that when I started talking to people of my mother's generation, you just couldn't stop them. So I came to the conclusion that this was a story which had to be told. I began by going through the Gibraltar Chronicles housed in the Gibraltar Garrison Library, but soon realized that these only told half the story, the official version, if you like. It was then that I was introduced to the archives, never imagining that one day I would become the archivist, and there I found a wealth of material to work on. And the eventual result, of course, was the publication of The Fortress Came First, which I believe proved to be a very popular work locally. And having been bitten by the publication lark, I then went on to write three further books on the history of Gibraltar. In all these, I tried to focus on the social and political history of the rock, as opposed to the many books previously published, which tended to concentrate on its military aspects. In 1996 came Stories from the Rock, which was really an adaptation of many and varied episodes which I had previously used in my radio talks and newspaper articles. And many years went by before my next publication, Military Fortress or Commercial Colony. The title is significant because throughout my studies of Gibraltar's social history, one the theme kept cropping up, namely the peculiar position of Gibraltar vis-à-vis -vis the mother country. I mean, although by large Gibraltarians lived in peaceful harmony with their military masters and at all times showed great loyalty to the British crown, by the last decades of the 19th century, there were those who yearned for the civic rights which Britain was by then granting to some of her other outposts. Britain resisted requests of this nature on the grounds of Gibraltar's peculiar position as a fortress colony since they said to grant such civic rights to the civilian inhabitants would be tantamount to endangering the security of the fortress. And so as a result, Gibraltarians moved into the 20th century, still ruled directly from London, and without much hope, it would seem, of achieving civic rights, at least in the foreseeable future. And it was only after the Second World War that some tentative advances were made with the formation of the City Council before the war in 1921 and the first legislature in 1950. Since then, since then, many more advances have been made and what was a military fortress has now become a thriving civilian community. And so here I am, all these years later. Hopefully, I have contributed little to the people's knowledge of the history of our small homeland. People of my generation tend to say that we are now in the departure lounge. My only hope is that the flight is delayed. <laughs> so, thank you.